the Ten Commandments for some are an archaic list of do's and don'ts. The truth is, though, that the, especially the final six commands in the Ten Commandments form the code of ethics for just about every culture on earth um, in some basic form. The biggest challenge to them, especially the final six, is I, uh, in quotes. If we could get I out of the way, then that would probably solve most of the issues that the world has. The problem is we can't do that on our own. And hence the first four commands, those that relate to a relationship with, uh, with, with God, with, with an entity that, that is above us. The necessity for us to have faith um, in something outside of ourselves. Some would say that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. But I tell you, you can be sincerely wrong. You see, faith is only as strong as the subject of your faith. Some would say, well, I believe in science. The problem is science is not a source. Science is a study to find the source. And so your belief wavers depending on who you're getting your science from, which textbook or which authority out there is delivering their interpretation of the science. And so faith wavers. You say, well, then I'll believe in myself. Problem is then your belief is limited by your own limitations. Uh, you can't do it all. You don't know all there is to know. You are frail. Your body is weak. You will grow sick. And so if, you're, if your belief is in yourself, if you have bought into the me culture, the I can do it, the, the power is in me, then at some point you're going to encounter just how limited that is. Uh, it has its limitations. You say, well, my belief is in love. And, you know, why can't we just all get along? And again, this love as the world understands it and this, this type of thing. But love in itself is subjectively defined depending on your cultural worldview. Love depends on a source for expression. Love in and of itself, as the world defines it, doesn't exist unless there's a source expressing that. And so if your belief is just in love, then who's defining that love for you? Which culture is defining that? Is it the culture that does everything in order to save face? Is it the culture that believes everything is right or wrong? Is it the culture that says an eye for an eye? Or is it the culture that says, well, you know, let's just let everybody just do whatever everybody wants to do as long as they're happy? Well, at some point, you're going to encounter a big problem with that because someone's not going to be loving somebody else because of the worldviews are all different. And so your belief can't be in love as the world defines it. So... What relevance do the Ten Commandments have to us today? Well, I want to look at the person who gives it relevance. And this summer, I want us to look at what does Jesus have to say? What does Jesus take on the Ten Commandments? So if you look in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 4, we will see Jesus take on the first of these commandments. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus had something to say about every single one of them. As we recall, Jesus did not come to do away with the Ten Commandments. He came to fulfill them, and he gives them a fresh expression. And so we can take that and see that these commands that were given some 3,500 years ago are still very much relevant to us today. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, is finalizing his encounter, his direct encounter with Satan. Now, he encounters Satan on a number of different occasions throughout his ministry. And this one is a very direct attack by Satan to see if he can't sidetrack Jesus and once and for all finalize God's plan of trying to redeem humanity. And so after a couple of temptations, Satan goes and takes Jesus to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world as much as they can see. And he says to them, Satan tells Jesus, I will give you these if you'll bow down to me because these have all been given to me. Now, we're not going to get into the validity, though. There is no valid point what Satan was trying to say. Jesus' response to Satan is the, the key or the focus of this morning. So Jesus responds to Satan at this time in Matthew 4.10. He says, be gone, Satan. In other words, I'm done with this conversation. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The first thing that the first commandment does as Jesus here is quoting um, 
a, the, the previous verse. But the first thing this, this commandment does is it shows us to God's exclusivity. The fact that in the first commandment, if, if you will see, back in Exodus chapter 20, God tells us, I am the Lord your God. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt and brought you out of slavery. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And what God is saying here is not the fact that there's other gods. What he's saying is, you will make no other gods. What God is really saying is, there are no other gods. I am it. I am the only one. Anything else that you might declare or put that label to is, is, is false from the get-go because there is no other divinity. I am it. I am exclusive. I am the only one around. So don't even try to bring anybody up. No one else compares. It is, it is it. And this is what Jesus tells Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. It is exclusive. Uh, Paul in 1 Timothy 6.15 uh, excuse me, before that, and, and to write into the Corinthians in chapter 8. You go here first, 4 through 6. The verses up on the screen says, Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. There is no God but one. And so Paul tells them then these, these so-called things that you bring up, these, these, these images that you put on walls or that you place on things, these are not divinity. In fact, Isaiah would go as far as to say it's really kind of absurd because you are the one who crafted these things, and yet now you're bowing down to something you yourself created. So as the creator, you have power over the thing you created, and yet you're placing it in power and authority over yourself. God's saying, listen, and Paul is reiterating it, there is no one else. It is me and, and me alone. In 1 Timothy 6.15, um, Paul is, is affirming to, to confirming to, to Timothy these things. And uh, he tells them, which he will display and bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, he is the only sovereign. God is not interested in being recognized as a powerful deity. He is the only deity and the only one. Nothing else even remotely compares. I mean, from the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. And that's all that really matters. From there all the way to the end of Revelation, the only thing that matters, in the beginning, God. He is the author and creator of the universe. He is, is God, and there is no other. There's a... Uh, view out there called henotheism, H-E-N-O theism. If you're uh, into the, the spelling bee which happens this last week, you could probably spell that. I had to look it up. Henotheism. But it's the view that says there are many gods, but you must choose which god you're going to put in first place. This is the view that many South Asian Indians or, or those who follow Hinduism would probably have because they have a pantheon of gods. And so you, you can have a bunch, but just choose which one you're going to put first. That doesn't work here, because God is saying there's only one. And so there's not others. It's not about putting him first. Sometimes we make the mistake of saying, well, I'm, going to put, I, I'm putting God first, and then my family second. And, and that really, we kind of sometimes confuse ourselves with that, because we don't put God first, and then we have our family, almost things like, well, my family's a deity to me, although, yes, Tori, you are a goddess to me, but we go <laughs> the other way. But it's, it's God and no else. It's not one, two, three, four. It's just God. And everything else kind of falls in line after that. And that's what God is saying. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Don't put anything else before me. Just There's, there's, there's nothing there. Monotheism is not just the Bible's first commandment, it's, it's the Bible's first thought. In the beginning, God. And so the first commandment sets a foundation for all the other commandments that are to come. The first commandment is really not part of that list of do's and don'ts. The first commandment is just really, I am God and there is no other. And so because of this, now I'm going to lay down nine other commands that are based on the fact that you get the first one right. That just be, the first one is just saying is, I am God. I am above all else. My exclusivity, he, he declares his identity as the I am. There, there, is, there is no other. 
Now, he does give the Israelites, and, and especially in Exodus, a reason to put him in that place, but he really doesn't need it. You know, God tells him, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. And he begins to, he lists for them a couple of major reasons why they should give him this place of authority. But God is not asking for our permission to be in this place. God is not asking for us to give him the right. We don't vote God into first place. He is there, whether you want it to be or not, he is God. And he doesn't, he doesn't depend on our submission to him for him to have this place of authority. He is this. He is the I am. I am. And that's, that's enough. And so we don't come to him. He has given us life and we exist because he desired it. He provided us for us. He has healed us. He has protected us. He has cared for us. He has blessed us. He has opened doors that needed opening. He has closed doors that, that should have been shut. But he does this for our benefit, not his. He is not doing these things so that we might then thank him worthy to be put in this place. He's in that place because he is God. What we've got to do is come to the point where we realize that. And as soon as we can do that, then we are better, better off for it. We realize our place in creation, that he is God. And as soon as I come to that, then I can realize, okay, you're God, I'm not. Which means that you are sovereign, I don't have to be. Which means that you're in control, phenomenal. Because the world is a mess and I don't know how to fix it. And so I can just submit myself to the Lord and say, God, I realize that for part of my life I tried to live with me being on the throne. I get it. I don't know how to do this. I messed it up and I continue to, to mess it up even now. I need you to be on the throne of my life. You are God. I am not. Help me, Lord, on a daily basis to realize this fact and to live according to it. I am the Lord, your God. So he is, he is, he is exclusive. He is the source of all that exists, from the smallest particle to the largest of galactic entities. God is the source of morality. For moral obligation, y'all, to have any force or binding obligation on us, it's got to rest on something greater than ourselves or majority opinion. As soon as we begin to relegate ma ma uh, morality to majority opinion, we're messed up. And that's where we're going. Is that there is a certain minority that is becoming now a certain majority at a fad who has taken the moral obligation authority away from God and placed it on themselves and saying, we know better than him. We're going to dictate what morality is. And if you're not on board with this, then you're going to be left out in the cold. Well, guys, I'm putting on my spiritual jacket because I could care less about being out in the cold. God is it. And if he says it, that's my moral authority, not what Hollywood says, not what my neighbor says, not what the people across the street say, not what Disney says. God is the moral authority. And the beauty of that is, is that he never changes. And so I can wake up tomorrow and know exactly what the moral authority is going to say because it can be the same thing it was today, the same thing it was yesterday. As Kevin DeYoung states in his book, The Ten Commandments and What They Mean and Why They Matter, he says, you know, the first commandment lays the groundwork for every other moral obligation. It is the Ten Commandments are the code of ethics for the Old Testament, and it is the code of ethics that underlies a lot of the teaching, most all the teaching of the New Testament. And so to, to get a better grasp of what this is, we have got to pay attention to them and understand so not only is God exclusive, but also our faith. It says, Jesus tells Satan again, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. A matter of worship, a matter of lordship. God's people have always suffered with some form of syncretism. This is where you take several beliefs and you kind of marry them and merge them and just kind of whatever comes out of that to benefit you or whatever seems best. We want to have a both and whenever God tells us it's either him or not at all. I wish that you would be hot or cold, but you are lukewarm. I want to spew you out of my mouth, Jesus tells the church in Laodicea in the book of Revelation. Joshua 24, 14, God through Joshua tells the people, you know, you choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, God, Joshua standing up as the man of the house, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he says, now, I don't care what you people do. This is what we're going to do. And men, this is what you've got to do and stand up. 
Our society needs men. Unfortunately, we're being run by a bunch of women who are doing this when the men should be the ones doing it, or at least supporting their wives. If the men don't have the pants to put on, at least support your wife while she does it. But men, we've got to stand up and be men and say, me and my household, this is what we're going to do. Aren't we, honey? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. K- kidneys, yeah, and I'm smart. Yeah, I guess this is what's going on. But man, we've, we've got to stand up. Me and my household, we, we will serve the Lord. First Kings 18.21. It says, Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping about between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people were just kind of left speechless. Going, you know, we, we don't have an answer to that. But how long? Jesus tells us in Matthew, no one can serve two masters. For either... He will love one and hate the other, or he will devote one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, as money being sort of the root of of all evil. Revelation 3.16, again, God talking, Jesus talking to the church in Laodicea, I wish you were hot or cold. Our faith cannot include and. If it's not God, then you're, you're believing something else. You can't add God and my work, God and these saints, God and my religion, God and going to church on Sunday, God and my family, God and country. There is no and. It's either God or it's not God but something else. God, it's it's, it's either or. It's it's either God or something else, but there's there's no end. God's not a genie in a bottle that you can just kind of put over here and say, God, I'm going to do this over here, and as soon as things get tough, I'll come running and and rub you and and, and get things working again so that I can go back to doing what I was doing. That doesn't work. You will worship the Lord, your God, and serve him only. And so it's an exclusive faith. It's also worship exclusivity. Worship's exclusivity. There's a key difference between the first commandment and the nine. The first commandment is not a do or don't really. It's a mandate of relationship. The other nine then begin to explain what that relationship looks like in its guidelines and to to kind of give us a, a hand. But it's a relationship of worship. It's who we give our allegiance, our devotion to. And, and it's got to be exclusive. In Deuteronomy 6.4, what the Israelites would call the Shema, because that in Hebrew, that's the first word of this. But hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And basically, in short, it says, the Lord our God, the Lord one. Our worship is exclusive to only one, to only one God. The problem is, is that a lot of times as, as we begin to, to place our devotion on other things, and other things begin to consume our time or consume our finances or consume our priorities rather than God and his kingdom, then what we call idolatry begins to set in. And this is not just the worship of images and things. These are things that begin to take on places in our life of, of devotion. Doug Stewart, who has some insight as an Old Testament scholar, provides some insight in what is idolatry. He says, idolatry is the stickler here. Idolatry is selfish. It claims, if I do that, that I can get this out of it. And that's why idolatry is so appealing. Because all of a sudden I can begin to dictate, or all of a sudden I have, oh, there's a benefit to this. If I'll just do these things, then I can get this out. The Israelites were very, very quick about this because with the idolatry, the Baal and all these other gods demanded, well, if you will just bring this type of sacrifice then this is guaranteed for you. So, so they, they believed. And a lot of times we approach God this way. Okay, God, if I'll just do this, then this is guaranteed. There is a philosophy that you'll hear very predominantly. If you will just come and do this, or if your faith is strong enough, or if you will add these, then this is guaranteed. This prosperity and this health, and the reason you don't have those is because you haven't done. That doesn't work. That is idolatry. Idolatry is selfish. It's, I will do this as long as I get something out of it. And as soon as your relationship with the Lord becomes that, then there is an idol somewhere you need to get out of the way. Idolatry is perceived as easy. 
It says, I don't need a moral code, and there is no need to pursue personal holiness. And so it, it really makes no difference what I do. I'll just show up, go through the ritual, and I'm good. For many, Sunday morning worship is an idol. If I'll just show up, worship an hour, the pastor, hopefully he's done by noon, I'm gone, I'm good. Don't have to do that anymore. Don't have to think about that. My Bible's on the shelf, and I'm good until next Sunday. Sunday morning worship might be an idol. If that's why you're doing this, is to feel good about yourself. But we have idols everywhere, and it's, it becomes, when we, religion has become a ritual practice so that you can feel good about something, there's probably an idol in there somewhere. Idolatry is convenient. I can worship on my terms and in my way. I'll come to God however I please. We were just talking about this. You probably saw this this morning in Bible study in 1 Timothy, where it says that Paul says this is where love is expressed. And part of that was a pure heart, which could be potentially a reference to Psalm 24, which who is able to come into the Lord's presence? He who has a pure heart and clean hands, which means you don't come on your own terms. Because you, can't, you cannot wash yourself. You cannot clean your hands yourself. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ and through his redemption do you come into his presence. Because only by then do you have his righteousness. You on your own terms are not pure or clean. And so, whereas idolatry is convenient, God worship is exclusive and Jesus is the only way. And we come to God on his terms, not on ours. Idolatry is normal. Everyone is doing it. I don't have to look weird or stand out if I'll just blend in with the crowd. And right now, those that, that uh, have a different morality and those that want to, to do a different group of ethics and those that say, okay, it's okay to, to fib on your, in, your taxes or it's okay to, to do business this way because it saves the bottom dollar. It's okay to use lesser quality materials because it saves on the bottom dollar. It's okay... To, to not walk in integrity because no one will know. And it, and it, and it saves, and, and everybody's doing it, so why don't we just hop in and do it as well? See, idolatry is normal. It's when you walk in the exclusiveness of God's worship that you're going to be the weird one. And so, whereas Austin likes to be weird, Austin ain't got nothing on a group of people sold out to Jesus Christ. When it comes to comparing us with the rest of the world. Idolatry is self-indulgent. It says that my worship of the best demands that I have the best. And so I, I give a little so I can receive a lot. So whenever you think that, that God owes you something. Or that your, your worshiper or just the little sacrifice that you've done merits that you get something great for it. There's probably an idol lurking in there somewhere, in, in a thought process or a belief that's kind of creeped itself in. So the first command, you shall worship the Lord, your God. God is exclusive. Our faith in him has got to be exclusive. There is no other. Our worship has got to be exclusive. It's the Lord, your God, is a personal. He wants to come to us as a personal uh, relationship. And, he, and he's the one who's done all the work to make that happen. You say, well, David, but still, this was written 3,500 years ago. How does this make a difference today? Because of the one who makes this an exclusive relevance. Jesus is God incarnate. He is the image of the Godhead deity. As John 8, 19 says, if you knew me, you would know my Father also. John 14, 9, he who has seen me has seen the Father. You see, it's not enough, to, not enough to say I worship God or love God. Because Jesus is God with us. Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. And so if, if you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. A few days ago, I confronted a, several groups of folks, and I told them this, do not come to me and tell me you love God. If your Bible's on the shelf and you never read it. Because Jesus says, he who loves me does what I say. And the only way you know what he says is if you open the Bible and read it. Because this is where what he says is in. So do not come to me and say, oh yeah, I love God. If your Bible's on the shelf and you don't know how to use it, 
and you're not reading it. Because, see, a love of Jesus, a love of who he is, a love of what he, the truth he has for me, that is the love of God. That's what makes God relevant to us today is Jesus. He is God in the flesh. He dwelt among us. He lived as one of us. We have a God, not that he needed to, but he took away the excuse of, God, you really don't know how I feel. God, yeah, you're up there, you created me, but you, you didn't live as one of us. You, didn't, you, you haven't gone through this. God took that away. Jesus has suffered everything you will possibly ever go through. And he did so perfectly, without sin, pure and holy. And so we can now go to him as our mediator between God and ourselves, Jesus Christ. We can go to him and say, Jesus, I, you know exactly what I'm thinking right now. You know exactly how I feel right now. You are what makes this relationship relevant to me, and it's exclusive in you. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Jesus is our exclusive relevance. Remember, God desires to be your Lord in a personal relationship, and it can only happen through Jesus Christ. And so recognize your need for God's forgiveness. Recognize that you have got to come to him and say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm imperfect. I am marred by my own rebellion to you, by the things that I have done wrong. I need you to come and to save me. Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you are God, and I need you to be Lord of my life. Please forgive me and do that. Confess Jesus as God. Invite him to be the Lord of your life, totally surrendered only to him. Our answers to what is satisfying, whom we can count on, whom we can call upon help, whom we can stand on for stability, whom we can place our hope on, is Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved.